Welcome, everybody, to the event, the story of plastic film discussion with creator Stib Wilson and local filmmaker Mark Dixon. Hello and welcome. Hey, Stib. Hey, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Howdy. How are you doing? Uh, thank you so much for joining the documentary film, The Story of Plastic. We're going to get started on our question and answer in just a moment. My name is Jake Whitmer. I'm with the Beaver County Marcellus Awareness Community. I've, I'm the community outreach organizer, and I grew up in Western Pennsylvania within a four mile radius of the Edgar Thompson Seal Mill. So I feel a solidarity with the people of Beaver County. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our two panelists so first up, Steve, Wil Steve Wilson, uh, he's the co-creator of The Story of Plastics. He's an award-winning activist, filmmaker, and educator working on the nexus of marine conservation, plastic pollution, and human rights. He has sailed the world's oceans to study marine plastic pollution and help pass the Plastic Free Waters Act, which is signed into law by President Obama in 2015. He also won a United Nations Ocean Hero Award for his work. Steve Wilson is the founder of the Break Free from Plastic movement, now compromising over 1,800 NGOs across the globe, working in solidarity to end plastic pollution at all intervention points across the plastics supply chain. The Story of Plastics is his first feature-length documentary and has earned several awards on the film festival circuit. Stiv is working with federal lawmakers to use the film to support the first comprehensive plastics legislation in federal Congress, the Break Free from Plastics Pollution Act. Stiv is also the co-founder of the Peak Plastic Foundation, a new organization focused on storytelling and campaign strategy for underserved frontline and, and fence line groups. Our second panelist is Mark Dixon. Mark is an award-winning filmmaker, photographer, activist, and public speaker, exploring the frontiers of social change on a finite planet. After graduating from Stanford University with a degree in industrial engineering, he worked for, a startup, for startup companies in Silicon Valley before turning to documentary filmmaking. His productions include Your, Your Environmental Road Trip, a year-long eco-expedition through all 50 United States exploring environmental sustainability. And Mark is currently working on a new documentary entitled Inversion, The Unfinished Business of Pittsburgh's Air. In December 2015, he crowdfunded a journey to Paris, France to attend and cover the United Nations Climate Change Conference, Conference of Parties, as a credentialed member of the press. Pittsburgh's group against smog and pollution, GASP, named Mark a champion for healthy air in 2017. Mark's activism photography has been featured in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you for joining us, Mark and Stiv. Um, let's get started with some questions. So the first question uh, for either of you is, Plastics are a major and overwhelming environmental justice issue. What can we do to stand up to powerful interests? All right, thanks, Mark. Um, uh, what can we do to stand up to powerful interests? I mean, essentially it's sort of like, we have to recreate, I think, how we go after the powers that be. One, I'm a big fan of collective action. And we've got a lot of work to do in building intersections between well-resourced, often white-led uh, nonprofit uh, NGOs um, and sort of community grassroots frontline fence line groups. So it's not about just partnering, it's about building equity throughout all of our organizations and sort of redefining how Grassroots fence line, frontline groups have access to the funding community um, and really amplifying those stories, but not 
not just as storytellers, but also getting deeply leveraging that storytelling deeply in the places where you know these monstrosities are being built. And I think you know one of the greatest opportunities we have right now is really tying the human health concerns to plastics production on the upstream end. You know, this issue has been framed as a downstream issue, a waste issue for a long time. And, right. it, you know, by the time plastic has got to real human suffering. So it's about collective action, building intersections and bridges and uh, changing sort of the power structures with access to resources and philanthropy. And that's, I think, our first order of business. Can I just add a little um, reflection on that as well and in, in addressing, you know, we got the plastic that's going to be coming out of the shell cracker and up in Beaver. And um, I think that there's there's real opportunity in preparing the community to um, to what's the right word? Um, basically getting the community prepared for a, a potential moment when industry makes a mistake. Um, we found that uh, around the Clareton Coke Works, um, community had been the community around Clareton Coke Works in south of Pittsburgh had been advocating for clean air for quite some time, along with much of the Pittsburgh region. Um, but um, it, we didn't see a, a major transformation in sort of the public's awareness of this issue or their their strong interest in in tackling it on a broader scale until Clareton Coke Works had the big fire in 2018. At which point we had some technology tools, we had a lot of networking in place, we had some, uh, you know, all the community groups already knew each other, and we were ready for the the influx of press that came when that moment happened to sort of transform it into a recruiting event and a and a real a, a more, much more powerful awareness raising event than it than would have happened if those groups had just kind of waited around to organize until after that incident occurred. So preparing for incidents is another critical part of, of addressing major industry. Thank you. Um, so this next question was one of the first questions we got in the chat from Prem. She asks, uh, how do we dismantle the narrative that a plastics boom in southwestern Pennsylvania will provide jobs or economic redevelopment for rural regions? How do we convince unions that a plastic boom isn't the way forward beyond just saying that clean energy is the future? Um, David, do you want to take a shot? I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Um, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I think historically when we look at Pennsylvania, we're looking at a lot of different industries and boom and bust cycles and what happens. and. Um, you know, there was an interesting report that just came out in Texas where all the abandoned oil and gas wills are something like $117 billion to clean up. I mean, that, that's, that puts every Texan on the hook for about $4,000 in remediation from a tax-based situation. So, and Pennsylvania has gone through tons of cycles um, this way. And Plastics is going to be the same. You know, I think one of the best leverage points is the economics of plastic production, fracking, and fossil fuels are so underwater that they, they are not profitable industries. And, you know, there's money, you know, in politics, there's money um, from venture capital trying to prop these things up and there's subsidies. But... Absolutely. But it's all falling apart, um, ultimately. And so these jobs, there's never as many as they promise. And they're highly dependent on, you know, a constant flow that is going to dry up. And so I, I think you just look historically at boom and bust and realize that this is not a sustainable future. And so with a renewable energy future narrative, the thing about renewable energy is it also means constantly renewing jobs. So if you're not dependent on an extractive economy to create you know, an industry, it means that it doesn't run out. The sun is not gonna stop shining. The wind is not gonna stop blowing. And so these are the sort of arguments is for sustainable economic development over time, 
you really want to focus on industries that are not prone to boom and bust. It's my thoughts. I think it's a really important question. And as far as um, having unions embrace a Green New Deal, I think um, a just transition is really important. And like you just said, uh, unions would get more jobs, not from the six or 700 that that will actually be there instead of the thousands, but um, in a sustainable energy industry, they would have thousands of jobs. They'd last longer because they're outside of that boom and bust cycle. And I'm interested if, if Mark has any thoughts. Thoughts on the nature of boom and bust cycle or follow on thoughts to Steve's reflections about? Um, so I can read the question, how do we dismantle the narrative that a plastics boom in southwestern Pennsylvania will okay. provide jobs or economic redevelopment? Got it. Um, I, I would have jumped in if I had uh, a lot more thoughts than what Steve offered. He was hitting a lot of the main points that I was reflecting on Great. in my own mind. I think that the economics are, are not holding up well. Um, yeah, a, and lots of what Steve said. If I think of other things, I will highlight them. I think there's nothing that can really replace um, uh, a, the pro, the, the, somebody's uh, eager desire for a job today with an actual job today. So while we resist uh, petrochemical development, really working hard simultaneously to build job opportunities in those sustainable industries so that it's not just something potentially out there, but it's actually something that everybody who's seeking employment actually has to make a trade-off of how they spend their time. Do I spend my time in a polluting industry where I might lose some years of health um, to gain some extra dollars, but also in a boom bust cycle that might not be there in, in 10 years or five years or two years or one year? Or do I build my career on a platform of sustainable uh, or green energy or green um, green industries that are cleaner um, and, have a, and have a more steady income and, and also that don't uh, force me to face my child at night and, and face their questions of, you know, why are you working in an industry that is really hurting our planet? Um, I think that the child's influence on the parents' decisions for what jobs they choose can actually make a more powerful difference than we might acknowledge. Um, and, and I think you see a lot of social shift happening that way because children are holding their parents and their grandparents accountable. Mm. So this next question is, how can we volunteer for Nurdle Patrol around the Shell plant? The Shell plant is in Manaka, Pennsylvania, Beaver County. Nurdle Patrol, um, Deb, do you have that um, the link or that handy? We can we can get that information for you and put it in the chat. That was discussed at uh, last week's Beaver County event series on water and Mountain Watershed is heading that up and I'll give you guys the um, the link in the chat. Awesome, thanks Erica, thanks Michelle, and thanks Deb. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll pop that into the chat. That's great, great question. Thank you. I think Neural Patrol is gonna be really, it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be fruitful, it's gonna be tragic, it's gonna be awful, all at the same time. Um, but it will really allow people to get their hands, you know, uh, hands wet, I suppose. Um, and a little bit dirty at finding these nurdles and, and seeing the trends change as Shell expands their business in the region. Right. I think uh, Representative Sarah Enamorado will be joining a Nerdle Patrol later this month with a mountain watershed. So that's really cool. And Steve lives on, lives on a sailboat named Nerdle. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next question, the clothing industry, especially sportswear, claims to be using recycled plastic. Is clothing part of the 2% recycled plastic? It, that's a really murky sort of chain of custody and those 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 are all self-report, like recycling rates are self-reported. Um, what most of the PET or number one plastics, soda bottles, et cetera, go into textile man manufacturing, um, but it's really being downcycled, meaning once you make a textile out of it, it's not going to, to be recycled again. And, you know, you also have the massive issue of once you wash synthetic clothing, you're putting out microfibers of plastic into the environment, um, which, you know, from a bioavailability standpoint, meaning, you know, when we talk about watersheds, 
to to eat a laundry basket or a shampoo bottle, you have to be a relatively large organism for that to yeah. affect you. But microfibers are bioavailable to the very building blocks of the food chain in any fresh or saltwater ecosystem. So they're incredibly dangerous. So these these sort of like claims of sustainability or or green clothing from recycled you know beverage bottles. Yeah. They're, they're bad. It, it, it's not a good way. Like until we get bottle to bottle recycling, I'm not interested. Um, we ultimately want if we're going to produce a bottle, we want to turn it into another bottle. Right. Um, this question is from Gail in the chat. How can we support bioplastics? Can you tell us about any major companies? So. There are all the major companies are invested in a biopolymer technology called PLA or polylactic acid. So this would be sort of like the corn cup or like corn based um, uh, cutlery that you see. The problem with this stuff is it doesn't actually biodegrade, biodegrade in a natural environment. So that is, you know, for, for, for bioplastics to biodegrade, they need uh, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, they need water, and they need air. And nowhere on earth do you have all three of those things in one place. So the other problem is they, when you compost them or they biodegrade in compost, you're not adding the kind of nutrients you need to make plants grow in the compost. Like you need the right mixture of nitrogen and carbon and all you're doing is adding carbon. And, and that is not what, what plants are craving when they grow. There is another biopolymer um, called PHA or polyhydroxyalkanoids. Um, there are some small companies. If you're interested, look at Mango Materials online and they're using they have a really cool technology where they're capturing uh, methane that would be flared off at, at sewage treatment and using that as a catalyst for enzymatic activity to produce these biopolymers. And PHAs are naturally occurring. Nature makes them herself um, at a scale we can't even comprehend, larger than we would ever produce them. And they naturally biodegrade in the environment. The one thing to remember about all plastics, whether they're bioplastics or dinosaur plastics, mm -hmm. is that to get the performance attributes in plastic, meaning if you want it rigid or you want it flexible, you have to add plasticizers, which are proprietary additives to give them their performance attributes. Those are persistent organic pollutants and they will remain in either the atmosphere, the land or the water after the plastic uh, piece of it biodegrades. So it's really, it's a really complicated question um, and none of the like really sustainable technologies are at market scale um, right now. Okay. Um... Any thoughts? Um, I think that uh, you know my filmmaking work. It wasn't mentioned in the in the bio, but that's okay because I don't include it all the time. I did some work on Rachel Carson and the um, the Power of One Voice documentary. And um, I, it, while I was making that film, I learned about um, some of these plasticizers that Steve talked about, and how I believe uh, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that BPA and BPS are both kind of in that category of chemical that changes the properties of a plastic into what they what they want it to be. Is that about right? Nodding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I believe that um, BPA. Um, uh, well, some of these plasticizers are are known endocrine disruptors and possibly uh, carcinogenic. Are you saying no, Jacob? I'm, I'm just shaking. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> With empathy. <laughs> yeah, so you're so, spot on, Mark. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, and so it, the an industry knows that these are endocrine disruptors and has known that they're endocrine disruptors, including some of them were actually um, highly useful at suppressing uh, cancers 
that required endocrine system hormones in order for them to propagate. And when you supersaturate the body with a certain hormone, you actually shut down the tumor. So they grab one of these endocrine disruptors or you know, these hormonal replicated or this, these um, hormone mimickers off the shelf from their chemistry lab and decided to just throw it into plastic. What could go wrong? Um, and now we have plastics leaching out endocrine disruptors all around the world, all around landfills. Um, you know, and, and that's when water will seep into a landfill, touch all the plastic that's been sort of partly broken down, degraded, s suck out those endocrine disruptors and then super concentrate them in the, in the effluent that flows off those landfills and then in, the, in and around the oily particles and fats and things that, that exist out in the ocean. So you get a whole endocrine disrupting chain that, that, that flows into the, into the ecosystem as well. Um, and I know that, Steve, we did talk a lot about endocrine disruption last time we talked together, and I didn't see it, it, it like gone into great detail in your film, but I wondered if you could touch on what you've learned, embellish or extend some of the comments that I've made just touching on endocrine disruption and the sort of the scale of that as a problem for us globally. So one of the biggest problems with like bifas, bifas, bifasino, <laughs> Bifacinals, bifacinals. Sorry, uh, thank um, you. Yeah, is um, I, I have trouble with that word. <laughs> is a lot of them are proprietary. BPA that you mentioned, bifacinol A, is is one that we do have pretty good data on um, from a toxicology standpoint. And where we have toxicology data, we typically have acute toxicity data, not chronic. So what the difference between throwing a gallon of this stuff in your face versus low level, low grade exposure constantly over time. So with BPA, it is a, a endocrine disruptor, a known endocrine disruptor. And you know what's really crappy about what industry does is, so BPA became this cause celeb. And what they did is you know all these fast moving consumer brands who are making like nail nalgene bottles or camelback you know we're using this polycarbonate hard plastic that was hard because you add bpa to it and and then other uh, companies with phthalates were also a, an endocrine disruptor which makes stuff flexible they went to the companies and said hey our customers don't want this in you know our products so what they did is add a sulfur molecule to the, the bifacinal chain, which was supposedly supposed to disrupt how the bifacinal um, um, attaches to the, 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 um, the, the endocrine, um, like how, how it attaches hormonally and mimics hormones. Mm -hmm. But what they found is like in subsequent studies is that BPS was much more efficient at disrupting the endocrine system. However, industry was saying we're BPA free. And so the, the thing to remember about, you know, you know, if you want to eat peanut butter, it's really hard to make peanut butter without using peanuts. So chemically, when we're talking about things, <laughs> like to give you the performance attributes you want or to create the thing you want, there isn't infinite, you know, combinations of molecules you can put together to create something. It's just not the way nature works. So, so, so they can't really fix these chemicals. They can kind of do a bait and switch with them. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we don't have data on, I mean, I don't even know, according to the like Basel and Stockholm conventions anymore, how many industrial chemicals are in commerce, but like less than 0.1% do we have any toxicology data on it. And it's typically acute. So we're, we're literally walking around in a giant experiment. Um, and we yeah. are the guinea pigs. And yeah. every subsequent generation has a, a, a bigger body burden of these chemicals because despite what you know you might see on Facebook about doing a master cleanse, you can't, you know, you can eat kale and carrot juice for like a month, but you're not gonna get rid of these these uh, pollutants that are in your cells, that are in your fat tissue. Um, the only way you can get rid of them is through breast milk and the umbilical cord. So 
every baby being born is going to have a higher and higher body burden. Um, mm. And we don't know what the tipping point is for, you know, when do we have three headed babies? Um, yeah, I mean, to be hyperbolic, but um, we don't know what that tipping point is or how much we can actually take in our system. Yeah, Michelle Neckaretti Chapkis from Women for a Healthy Environment just commented on here. They've done a lot of work with plastics and health. And she mentions that endocrine disrupting chemicals equals early onset puberty, decreased sperm counts, low fertility in women, obesogens, i.e., increasing increase in weight, respiratory problems, certain cancers, neuro and learning disabilities, just to name a few. Thank you for that, Michelle, for sharing that. And also, I will say that they're looking at some of the impacts of these endocrine disruptors. Um, and I'm not sure if this is specifically tested in endocrine disruptors from plastics, but I know that some endocrine disruptors have um, uh, intergenerational effects. So they're finding the effects propagated through generations um, of families that may have had a, a, a large exposure at one point or a exposure an exposure at one point, and then the child has it because they're in the feed, you know, they're, they're a, you know, partly formed in the fetus at the time of exposure, and then the eggs inside of the fetus that are slowly forming might then also be able to propagate. And we don't know how far those um, endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals will be able to influence generation to generation, uh, possibly through epigenetic means. So not through the genome, but through other means that are propagated down the generation. So this is a, this is a problem that is building on itself and we do not know, as Steve mentioned, this it's really, we're living the experiment. They're finding, um, and uh, Michelle neckready is also, there was a program that, that I filmed for them where they, they had a researcher talking about finding plastic pieces inside of the placenta. Wow. Um, the next question, Steve, how long did it take to make the film? What was your personal biggest takeaway, meeting people from all over the world so this this film came about um about 10 years ago from you know i started on this issue from looking plastics at a, as an ocean issue which is the early people who were who were working on plastics sort of raised the alarm of of ocean pollution and i sailed to the gyres and contributed some scientific studies that did the first global estimate but that sort of begot the question of where is this coming from so searching upstream um I got to the Philippines and I was in a landfill called Smoky Mountain, which is so named because it vents methane um, that is actually combusted from pressure. And people were living in this landfill and mining it. And, you know, when we talk about throwing something away, I was like, this is a way, this is the end of the road. This is the, the poor developing world country that is bearing the brunt of our consumer lifestyle in rich countries. And at that point, I decided to make the film and, and tell it from a human rights perspective. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway was, you know, it, from when we started filming to when we, we premiered um, about this time last year um, at Mill Valley Film Festival, was about two and a half years from when we started shooting um, to getting it um, to the public. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway was for all the tragedy that's out there and, you know, some of this stuff, like the scene of the Ghazipur landfill in India with the dairy farm adjacent to it, like for anybody who studies toxics, um, the like, vector of pollution from the leachate of that landfill going into the water that cows are drinking for dairy milk that is going to humans. Like that exposure vector is like, you can see it in real time. Um, that was like one of the hardest days of my life. Uh, but also realizing like there are people all around the world who have solutions to these problems they're just not getting the microphones and they're not getting the resources. So I think the biggest takeaway is we need to diversify our leadership and resource, resource mobilization because 
there's a lot of people in poor countries. There's a lot of people in the Gulf, um, environmental justice advocates. There's a lot of frontline communities who know exactly what to do to solve this problem. They're not just they're just not getting the same privileged resources that you know a lot of global north or white led groups are getting. So um, that was my biggest takeaway. Um, this next well, can I can I just add real fast to that? Yeah, um, yeah, that was a big reason why I got into filmmaking too, Steve. Um, so I totally resonates with me. Um, you mentioned that PHA was the more natural kind of a uh, plastic type of of thing. Yeah, um, that really struck me because, and I wanted to raise that up as a as something that that is how I like to think about um, when uh, this issue when when industry is trying to say, well, you know we got to make this plastic to do this thing. They're ignoring the way often that nature has already figured out a way to do a thing kind of like that, that serves a lot of needs and is biodegradable, but is less profitable for one person or for a small group of people because it, it sort of, there aren't as, you know, it, it, it has just a different structural element to how it's made and what are the, what are the, um, the benefits and what are the drawbacks. And I think there was a, a word that, that I, came across in my filmmaking called Biomimicry, which was coined by a woman named Janine Benyus. And we talked to her in, in my Yurt documentary, and it's basically looking to nature for these solutions. PHA, it's like looking to nature for these kinds of solutions. The neat, neatest part about biomimicry is that you don't have to be a creative genius to, to like figure out amazing solutions. All you have to do is look at how nature has already figured out yeah, how to do those real, kinds of things. Real. Yeah, and then make the most of that. It's almost like you just need to open the book and see instead of pushing the book off, burning it and turning a blind eye to the infinite potential that nature has already established over billions of years of evolution. So mm -hmm. just wanted to raise that up. Mark, um, how important is film to getting out the message about the harms of plastic pollution and petro? What do you hope to achieve through your art? Um, so I, I feel that film plays a role in an ecosystem and it's a tool that I'm familiar with and, and feel like I can bring to the community. Um, I, I think that um, I really like how film allows people sometimes for certain types of films, um, for them to see themselves, um, see their fellow community members, um, identify, might identify with somebody in the film or the way something was said in the film. Um, that that they might not have thought of on their own or without that that limit you know that that um kind of a little bit contrived exposure opportunity that film creates i find also that film allows for really getting to the heart of something really really efficiently where you might think for months or years on a topic but after hearing probably as stiff can probably relate to this you hear like 50 people talk about a thing a certain way and you realize that there are certain patterns of language that are maybe a little more effective or a little bit more that stick better with your audiences through through discussion and Q&A and through surveys and other types of feedback mechanisms, you can learn what are the ways that the, that the message that you think is really essential here can be conveyed. And you may not even know what the message is that need to be conveyed, that needs to be conveyed before you do the filming and do the editing and share it and you sort of get into it a little bit um, and the message sort of comes to you sometimes. Um, I don't like it when, when things are a little bit more organic like that, but then once you have the message that is sort of emergent, then you can work within the film context to craft it. And instead of, as I found, stumbling along in a public presentation where you're giving it live and give it sort of Q&A and you have to be there every time as an individual person to share that message repeatedly every time, you can, you can make, kind of compact that message into a film, make sure it's exactly what you want it to be, and then let the film go off on its own to have the influence that you're hoping to, you know, to, or to, to have the, uh, yeah, the influence that you're hoping that film will have without needing your personal attention to every second of that exchange. So that, that's just some of the sort of theoretical benefits of what I see film being able to do. I can dig more into the Petro side of it um, in a moment. I'll just, I don't, I want to stop, but I want to just add one tiny thing is that I found that a very efficient way of bringing film to bear on the petrochemical issues around in our region is by simply going in, filming a whole event where maybe there are testimonies that are being given by community members and then elevating their voices. So I go in, I just film the testimonials and then pop a testimonial, you know, one of the more powerful testimonials that I think really might resonate with the community, pop that right on Facebook. So instead of going to a four hour hearing and then listening to 50 people talking about stuff that you may or may not care about, you just get that one little three minute nugget, let that go around Facebook and pique people's interest in the topic. And then they can dive infinitely down into wherever they want. But sometimes a, a filmmaker can help 
condense that message and get it to people who don't realize they want to hear it. So we're going to have a few more questions. We have about 10 or 15 minutes left for the Q&A. Um, Tamara asks in the chat, what do you think about the new bill just passed by Governor Newsom in California? And she expands on that. Uh, the Association of Plastic Recyclers applauds California Governor Gavin Newsom today for signing the United States' first ever recycled content mandate for plastic beverage containers, CA Bill 793. If either of you have... I'm a fan of this bill. So, you know, if we're trying to create circularity and, you know, for, for years, industry has, the plastics industry has been saying, recycle, recycle, recycle. Well, if recycling actually worked, they wouldn't be championing it because mm -hmm. they would be, they, recyclers would be a direct competitor to people who extract. So, so you know, they don't actually, industry doesn't actually put forward these bills that um, mandate more recycled content. So number one, plastics, like plastics, you know, as we use them in commerce, they're, they're not all created equal. Some are much more toxic than others. Um, PT number one is, is pretty inert comparatively. It doesn't solve all the like environmental justice issues upstream of where it's extracted and refined. But downstream, if we're trying to get, you know, less of a market for more fracking, more refining, more crackers, um, we want more recycled content in. Um, and so the, the great thing about, you know, California, and a lot of people love to hate California, is it's the sixth largest economy in the world. So if you're a beverage producer and you have a mandate to put in recycled content, that policy goes far beyond um, the borders of the state. So ultimately we want to get to 100% bottle to bottle recycling and cut out 15% of the overall demand for the mm. chemicals we need to make plastic. So yes, I'm a fan of, of this bill and a lot of my colleagues uh, worked really tirelessly on it. Um, Tamara also asks, um, what is preventing bottle to bottle recycling now? Um, so one, <laughs> there aren't enough policies reci requiring recycled content mandates um, because recycled content is more expensive than, I mean, it's so hard to compete with an industry that is subsidized, that is, I mean, fracking in the fossil fuel industry is a house of cards. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in a free market system. It needs subsidies, political favors, vulture venture capital. It's, it's totally propped up. It's a fake industry. Um, so how do you compete with that when you're actually turning a resin into another resin? Um, so one, policy is, is, is the problem. It also requires a different kind of repolymerization technology because every time you recycle something, that is, you melt it down and thermoform it into another object, it loses some of its structural integrity. So, but if you repolymerize it, that is break it down to monomer molecules and rebuild the polymer chain, it's as good as new. Um, mm -hmm. That's more expensive. And there's only a few of those um, processors um, to, today. There's one in Riverside, California called Carbon Light which can do true bottle to bottle recycling. Um, you're always gonna lose a little bit um, from one bottle to the next, three, five, 10%. Um, but um, ultimately it's the market uh, and policy that needs to level the playing field. That's what's preventing it. Because once like, the last thing I'll say is with Newsom's law like that he signed here, that's going to attract venture capital to recycling processing because now there is a, a, a statutory market for recycled content. And that's what we need. And that's where, you know, regulated free enterprise actually works. 
Right. So this question from the chat. Stiv, you use cartooning in your films. What do you like about cartoons? You know, it's to be honest, it's sort of a mix of of love and hate with cartoons. Cartoons are a great way to really quickly explain an issue. I don't know that they actually get the emotional import at times. And sometimes I think, you know, there was a time when they were super appropriate in sort of this neoliberal fantasy that we can keep doing what we're doing. We just need to innovate or change. And, you know, everything's okay if we all, you know, work together to solve a problem. So I think the campiness of them is a liability, but at the same time, they visually explain a complicated issue very quickly. So in our film, we decided to employ them, but use, but not use a narrator, which we felt was sort of inauthentic. We actually used real um, sound bites uh, from interviews that I conducted while making the film. So it was sort of a, it was, it's a double-edged sword, um, if you ask me. Okay. We're going to get to one or more, one or two more questions. Jennifer asks, how should we think about solutions that sound good, but may or may not be more helpful? For example, reusable shopping bags use a huge amount of plastic and can't be recycled, yet paper bags may cause deforestation, etc. Bioplastics might sound great, but I'm also concerned that large-scale agribusiness that provides PLA or bioplastics from corn cause huge issues as well. So the, the one thing I'll say on this, and I'll turn it over to Mark, is when we look for solutions, we have to retrain our brain. It's not about just substituting one thing for another. Like, we talk about systemic problems or systemic interventions. We're not trying to just create a substitution at one part of the system. We're actually trying to change the whole system. Mm -hmm. So product delivery writ large shouldn't be dependent on disposable anything. It should be a reuse economy, um, a service-based economy. Um, and that's sort of where we get to a just transition is is how do we create a new system, an economic benefit that is spread out, um, you know, across the, the, the labor market um, and can transition people from making uh, or propping up a disposable culture. So I guess, you know, there's lots of unintended consequences. And, you know, from the standpoint of a policy right now, is charging fees on anything disposable discourages them significantly. So it's not about banning one thing and propping up another thing. It's about is making reusability an attractive um, vehicle for, del for product delivery. Mm. Um, thank you everyone for submitting questions. We're gonna get to one last question. Um, is there a possible solution? Is there a possible solution for people in the U.S. who own land to create their own safe storage for plastic waste via sending it to landfills, or I think they mean instead of sending it to landfills, like become your own landfill? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't fully understand the question either. Um, that's okay. Um, get some and get get the right enzymes and uh, or the right uh, dissolving. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we have we have a comment. Um, Stiv, thanks for bringing in the multinational, multicultural part of the conversation in the film. That's such an important part of the problems and solution that doesn't get as much press. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up here, and we're going to have a mark's going to put up how you can get involved with beaver county marcellus awareness community and other ways that you could take action um yeah i want to thank stiv again for coming mark dixon for being on the panel you guys are great and i thought the film was really powerful thanks all for having me and thanks all for tuned in and um if you have follow-up questions you can reach me at stiv 
at peakplasticfoundation.org um, and follow our journey Instagram um, at Peak Plastic. Thanks. And Thank this, you, Tim. Yeah, I'm glad to be here too. Thanks for having me. Um, it's an awesome film and um, I hope that it, it just screens all over the place. And I just want to be clear, I was not involved in the creation of this film. I'm just another filmmaker hanging out with Steve because I think he's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Mark, for recording. But he'll that. be involved in the next one. So, all right. Take it easy. Yeah. This should be recorded and it should be up on Facebook in the next few days, I believe. Thanks to Mark. And thanks, thanks to Halt the Harm and Ryan. Thanks uh, to Halt the Harm and Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You, thanks, everybody. It's been awesome to be here and uh, what a fantastic conversation. Great, thanks.